and to the Japanese public. Just as how your government has made the foolish decision to pay 200 million to fight the Islamic State, you now have 72 hours to pressure your government in making a wise decision by paying the 200 million to save the lives of your citizens. Sad to say that America and the world have now become somewhat desensitized to hostage videos and threats of cutting off the heads of innocents. They are sad to note a part of life in a violent and turbulent world. But no one seems to be asking a simple question about fighting the terrorists and at the very least seeking to blunt their message. Let's ask that and much more. Let's welcome back to Midpoint, former CIA operative and the author of Jawbreaker, the attack on bin Laden and al-Qaeda, a personal account by the CIA's key field commander, Gary Bernson. Gary, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be with you today. Gary, unfortunately, we have to begin right now by talking about the Japanese hostages. There is now a report from CBS News saying that supporters of these extremists are circulating a message on Twitter at the moment saying the two Japanese hostages have already been executed, but no proof has emerged. I would guess your immediate reaction would be you would not be surprised. Well, of course, I would be horrified to learn that, saddened to learn that. You know, the Japanese government had a history of giving in to these sorts of negotiations, uh, these terrorist threats. Back in 1977, you know, a uh, JL aircraft was uh, hijacked by the Red Army. They paid $6 million to release 158 hostages, and their prime minister, uh, Takeo Fukado, made the famous statement that uh, human life outweighs the weight of the world. And they, so they made a payment, and, um, and that's known. Uh, we don't want to see the Japanese make a payment. We'd like to see these people be rescued, but sadly, ISIS, uh, uh, you know, will kill almost anyone they get their hands on, and hopefully, this will harden the Japanese uh, and and others around the world to see that this is not just an attack on the West; it's an attack on the global community. Now, as we wait for some sort of confirmation here, let's go back to the Japanese here. There was an individual named Sumo Shiryosaki, I believe was the name, one of the released terrorists. Japan paid for these terrorists. And then, of course, this person came back to conduct attacks as a terrorist after being released, bought and paid for. Tell us about this. Right. This was one of the Japanese Red Army members that the that was was released uh, by the Japanese under that agreement where the $6 million were paid. And he bombed the U.S. Embassy in Rome. He bombed us in Jakarta. He did a bombing in Naples, killed a number of people. We captured him. I was actually in charge of the capture of him in South Asia. Almost 19 years later, we hunted this guy down. The point is, is when you release terrorists, they just don't go away. They come back and attack you again. And the Shirasaki case, and actually Tosoma Shirasaki is in federal prison in the United States uh, doing a life sentence. And he will go back to Japan eventually, and or he's charged in a multiple uh, number of countries uh, for attacks. But these people just don't go away. And just like Gitmo, you know, you release these people, they come back to the battlefield. As Shirasaki did, the others will as well. Do we need to start learning the lesson? You said harden the Japanese here, and maybe that's something else that we need to talk about. Because there's now a report on ABC News where they're discussing that officials, intelligence officials, and experts on the terror group, on ISIS, say that this extortion ploy was never going to be worth the money. This was not about getting $200 million. They knew they wouldn't get it. This was extortion. It was political and not financially motivated. Is that what we have to continue to drive forward here? 99 times out of 100, they know they're not going to get the money, and we are simply helping the cause along by pushing these videos, pushing their demands, and showing them basically coming up with another deadline over and over again. It and I would say, right, and I would say they get paid more often than not. They get paid a lot, and, and that's not always covered. But who is paying them then? If the Japanese don't do it, we don't. Who's forking over the cash? Many other individuals are being kidnapped, captured. You've got Turks. You've got countries from across the world that, that they capture their people, and they cut deals. They need money to run their organization. We're attacking their infrastructure. They're attacking their oil sales. We're attacking this. They need to make money, and they're going to continue. And, and it's kidnapping to fortune is what this is. Gary, how do we get down to this, though? How do we, how do we then? i got about 30 seconds left here before we break, but how do we then get down to the root of the problem here if we're stopping a lot of the oil sales? And how do we get down to these other nations and these hostage demands? we got to put political pressure on them, and that's the, the, the office of the ambassador for counterterrorism in the State Department. We've got to talk to our allies. We've got to talk to people around the world. We make sure that no one makes any payments to ISIS as we attempt to strangle them financially. And then we need to get, eventually we're gonna need a ground force out there. They're going to have to be destroyed.
All right. Gary, please stand by for a couple of moments here because we will come back. I want to bring to everybody once again, we are getting a lot of reports in right now, but according to CBS News, the supporters of ISIS are circulating messages on Twitter saying two Japanese hostages have been executed, but according to CBS News, there is no proof that has emerged at this time. We're going to continue to watch this, talk to our sources, come back, also discuss the suspect death of an Argentine lawyer, the death of a king, and another failed U.S.-backed government that will turn a region upside down. It's coming up right here on Midpoint. He was the key commander coordinating the fight against the Taliban forces around Kabul. Former CIA operative Gary Bernson returns for another go with us here on Midpoint. Let's turn to Argentina right now. And this is an interesting murder of a prosecutor found dead in his apartment that was supposed to be a suicide. They couldn't find any powder burns on his hands. Even the president now doesn't believe it's a suicide. But, Gary, the key here that makes this something we need to care about is the involvement of the Iranians. Tell us about this. In 1992 and 1994, there were bombings in Argentina. Uh, the 92 bombing was against the Israeli embassy. The 94 bombing was against the EMEA building. That was the Argentine-Israeli Mutual Friendship Society. Those were done by Hezbollah and Iran together in response to the Israeli selected strike against Hezbollah Secretary General Abu Musawi back in 92. And so for many years, this investigation has gone on. Initially, there was a judge by the name of Galeano that led that relationship. The relations between Argentina and Iran were broken because Iran was culpable, clearly. And the investigation from the area of Buenos Aires where the attacks took place led us back to the tri border. The tri border is that terrorist haven in, central, in, 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 in the center part of South America called the tri border where Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay meet. So I actually was chief of Hezbollah operations in CIA for a number of years and was directly involved in the effort against the terrorists in the tri-border area and this investigation. But Nisman, the prosecutor we're talking about, has taken this over from Galliano, and he was investigating the fact that Argentinian President uh, Cristina uh, Fernandez Kitchener was whitewashing uh, uh, this investigation so that she could tr have a trade deal with the Iranians. And this is important because back in 2002, the Argentinian economy collapsed, Argentina has become a pariah internationally, financially, not paying its debts, not agreeing to, to, to meet the standards of the IMF. And uh, additionally, it seized the, the Spanish pipeline, the Repsol pipeline. So Argentina was in a bind. It had no friends. It's got no friends financially. And they decided to do a whitewash to cut a deal with the Iranians because no one will do business with Iran. This prosecutor was about to put all of this dirty laundry out and... He was assassinated the night before he was supposed to present his findings. We are, day. we are talking about Iranian influence in other governments here, Iranian money. Gary, I know you can't hit a number here, and I'm not asking you to, but would the American people be shocked if they were to learn the truth about how many backhanded, under-the-table deals countries around the world are involved in at this moment with the Iranian government? American banks and Western banks have paid hundreds of millions of dollars of fines going against international sanctions. These are American banks because they've made so much money that they don't mind paying a couple of hundred million dollars in fines. And so it's not just countries around the world, even American and Western banks have been doing this because just as there was corruption in the food for oil program in Iraq, the entire sanctions regime against Iran has been a payday for banks, American banks, and an international banks. A couple of minutes, we got two other things quickly here. Now we have seen the complete collapse of the government in Yemen. This was an American-backed government. Four months ago, the president of the United States called this an ideal solution, an ideal look at governments in the Middle East. With this collapse, what does this do then to our intelligence? What does this then do, in our opinion, in fighting against the terrorists? This is an unbelievable, the administration's misreading and the fact that they would use Yemen as an example of successful counterterrorism operations is just a stunning disconnect from reality. The Iranians are playing big on that field. They've supported the Houthis, who are Shia. And this attack in Yemen and this projection of Iranian power is really upsetting the Saudis because this is the southwestern corner of the Arabian Peninsula. The Iranians have fought back Shia influence in Bahrain, they have fought it back in eastern Saudi Arabia, where we had the Kobar Towers attack on the U.S. by Iran and Hezbollah of the Hejaz. Sh that those were Shia in, in Saudi Arabia. So this is a big battle going on. This is a battle between 
the Sunnis in Saudi Arabia and the Iranians. The Saudis have been our partners in this. And this administration's handling of Saudi Arabia has enraged our allies and emboldened our enemy, Iran. It has been mishandled terribly by the administration. And I don't think they, you know, the president even mentioned it the other night in the, the State of the Union uh, as this thing was coming apart. We all knew it was coming apart. And uh, it's, it's, it's all pretty shocking. It's just shocking incompetence. 30 seconds. Who should be more worried about Saudi Arabia, the United States or ISIS and Al Qaeda? Well, I think that uh, ISIS and Al Qaeda will see a response from the Saudis. You know, you've had the passing of King Abdullah and it's been passed to Salman, who was one of the Sudari six, one of the, you know, the brothers of, the, of a single mother uh, from uh, uh, the, the, the founder of, of Saudi Arabia. You've got the next generation below. You've got guys like Mohammed bin, ba bin Nayef, and you've got Prince Bandar and a few others that are pretty tough guys. They've got good relationships with the West, and they've been conducting a war against these guys. And I would believe that the Saudis are going to gear up, and I think that the Saudis will be involved behind the scenes in, in Yemen trying to, to create a coalition, and they'll fund it. And I think that you're going to see the Saudis get tough on ISIS and uh, al-Qaeda. Let's They're watch. not going to back down. Keep our eyes on it as well. Gary Bernson, always a pleasure to have you on the show, my friend. Thanks so much for your time. Stay with us. Midpoint will continue.